What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome, Mike, to the channel. Welcome, Mike, to the headquarters. This is Big Dogs Gotta Eat fantasy football you might be watching this on the bunk bed breakdowns youtube channel or listening via the podcast if you're not already subscribed to both of those both the visual version and the audio getting kicked into your ear make sure you do that those will be linked in the description first thing in the comments as well they're putting out a ton of dynasty content on their own outside of the big dogs main channel that you are on right now today today we're talking about general draft strategy because Everyone's redraft leagues are happening right now. You might have already drafted, but a lot of people are drafting this weekend or in the days coming up. So we want to talk about general strategy. Just literally look at round by round, guys we like, positions that we're going to be attacking, and what spots in the draft we're going to be attacking. I don't know who the fuck started the trend in this industry that like you don't win your league in drafts and like you win <laughs> it on the waiver wire. But like I'm tr- like I don't understand. You know, <clears throat> Was Christian McCaffrey available on the waiver wire last year? Was Lamar Jackson available? Like, I don't understand where that theory came from because yeah. it, it, it's just an outrageous thing to say. And there are good waiver wire pickups, but they're not what win you your league. So I think drafting soundly and strategically and understand what you're doing from a game theory standpoint is extremely important. And that is what we are going to get into today. All the trends that we have watched and seen over the last three, four, five, six months since we've been putting out content on the channel is coming to fruition in this beautiful cocktail today. Dude, dude, I remember I put out that tweet like a while ago where I said like redraft leagues are won and lost in the draft and then dynasty leagues are lost in the draft but via one via trade. And everyone's like, I can't agree. The waiver wire is so important. Like you gotta it's like, uh, it's like, dude, that's like that's like saying like because LeBron didn't score the last point in the final seconds, his like prior 50 points didn't fucking matter. Like that's like, yeah, that's everyone simple... would immediately just go to like the one waiver wire ad that was good. Yeah. In the playoffs one time I'm like, okay, who was the best waiver wire pickup of last year? Was it like Terry McLaurin? Like he didn't win you your Brian fight. Hill, Ty yeah. Johnson. We thought they'd be good. Yeah, exactly. Yo, Mike, just make sure your, uh, your mic is turned up a little bit. I so turned it up. Is it still good? Yeah, now you're now you're fucking booming. Baby. Oh, okay, nice. All right, I turned. We up. get the mic. Let, let me turn mine up a little bit. All right, how's yeah, it now? <laughs> hey Noah. Yeah. Hit the intro. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I think I think the best way to look about look at the, the general strategy or like how you're gonna attack a draft is is very specific to where you're drafting this year. I think the hardest the hardest spot to draft from this year is the very early spots. Like the one, two, three is usually the best. Like you always want one of those elite running backs, and that seems to be the strategy year in, year out. This year it gets really difficult because we've seen this whole uh herd mentality of going over to the double running back thing right like we want to start off with Clyde Edwards Hilaire and Josh Jacobs or Miles Sanders and Nick Chubb or something like that if you're shooting from the one two three spot you don't have a chance at that in the back end of the second round and what makes it difficult is the second tier running backs are off the board the second tier wide receivers are off the board so you're left you know reaching for if, you, if we're talking about one quarterback league you're set reaching for Lamar Jackson or you're set reaching for Chris Godwin or a tight end or something like that I'm 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 like curious what your guys' thoughts are because I've I've probably come around to where I've settled on. And even in super flex leagues, like those those quarterbacks don't drop. You know, you have the top six guys, and sometimes, you know, Deshaun Watson or uh, Kyler or whoever will drop to the two eleven, two twelve. But it's it, it's a tricky spot to draft them. So what are you guys looking at in the first couple of rounds if you're drafting early on? Um, so I mean you're you're getting one of Christian McCaffrey, Saquon Barkley, like Alvin Kamara, Zeke, uh I also like Cook and Alera, but that's more towards the middle. I actually don't mind it uh, drafting from early, uh, especially if you're if you're in a super flex league because you. I think I think generally speaking, at least for super flex for me, I like to wait on quarterback because like one of the most appealing things about quarterbacks in super flex dynasty is like it's lo- longevity. Like they last forever. Like you don't have to trade them. Blah blah blah. I don't really like that, but like that's what people think, right? But like that that doesn't really come into question at all. In, in redraft leagues and then some of those older guys which you like would obviously fade in dynasty you can draft in redraft because like, again there's no long-term implications you got like drew Brees, you got the run ben roethlisbergers you got the tom brady's like these guys can still produce and, and put up for you uh so i tend to just fade quarterback so like if you're drafting from the 101 you're probably still not getting a running back but what you can get is a couple of like bang up like stud wide receivers so you can go like cmc 
like I've seen, I've seen like, you know, Julio fall. I've seen like Adams fall sometimes, uh, but even not, even if not them, you could get like a Godwin, right. You can get like CMC Godwin plus like Mike Evans, right. Or CMC Godwin plus a Rob. Like, I think that's a pretty legit opening, especially if you're playing like three wide receiver league. So I think you still have an advantage drafting from early because what happens is now you can get guys like DeAndre Swift. You can get guys like Cam Akers and, and you maybe have to reach a little bit with your five Oh one, but, that's like totally okay because I think those guys will return value. So that's why I'm kind of okay drafting from early still um, versus drafting from the back part. Yeah, I'm right there with Mike because when you think about it, and I got some DMs like this past weekend, it's like, bro, I have a chance I can be the 108, the 112, or the 101. What should I do? I don't want to be the 101 because I don't get two good running backs. The thing is, Christian McCaffrey <laughs> is like two good running backs in one. Like you look at what we put up last year, it's like 26 a game. You look at Joe Mixon plus Nick Chubb, it's like 28 a game when those two are combined. I'm not saying it's going to be a carbon copy last year, but when you get Christian McCaffrey giving you 20 to 25 points a game, probably the same with Saquon Barkley. Like Mike said, you can just go with Christian McCaffrey or Barkley at 101, 102. The way back, you can get like a D-hop and Chris Godwin stack or like a Chris Godwin, Kenny Galladay stack. And in the fifth or sixth rounds or whatever, you can get a Cam Akers. You can get a DeAndre Swift. And at that point, when you have McCaffrey or Barkley as your running back one, your running back two doesn't have to be as good as Nick Chubb to make up the ground for not selecting one in the second round and those wide receivers in turn will give you a safer floor week to week because you're not waiting till the fifth or sixth to, to get one so in super flex leagues as well as mike was saying i do like to wait on the quarterback too because you can still get a ryan Tannehill, a gardner Minshew, pretty late later on those are two guys that we were targeting in our value type of videos and players that you should be targeting because they're going a little bit later than uh, what most people expect because what they add on the ground and through the air so i don't mind too much waiting on the quarterback position and then if you're really feeling frisky, just like go for a Tyrod Taylor late. I know he's probably one of the better quarterbacks in the NFL, so you might not be able to wait too long on him. But <laughs> even him or like a, a Ryan Fitzpatrick pretty late is your quarterback three. If you have those other two guys, all you need is a third player for a bye week or an injury. And I think if you wait long enough, like those are pretty decent options for you. Yeah, I think the Tyrod call is good because if you get C-Mac fade the running backs for the rest of the draft and you get your RB2 with Tyrod. And <laughs> How much longer do you think the going to be? What's that? <laughs> I'm, I'm ready uh, to go right now. <laughs> please do us a fucking favor. So I, I admittedly, I haven't done many mock drafts. I don't know why, but I haven't done many mock drafts super flex because we've been drafting on underdog like nonstop. And that's all one quarterback leagues. And the two drafts that I've done for redraft so far that were paid were both one quarterback leagues as well. So I'm, I, I guess my mind hasn't really tuned into the fact that like you can get much better value at the, I've even seen in, in some super flex mocks, like Atari kill will fall to like yeah. a two nine or two ten, And in that, in that case, that's like an amazing fucking turnout yeah. for you. Uh, I, Mike. Yeah, I mean, no. right now, if you just look at it, Julio Jones is uh, ADP is 20th overall at wide receiver four. So if you slot in a L Lamar Jackson, a Patrick Mahomes ahead of him, he's pushing back to the second round. Right. So and Julio is like, to me, is like a pretty, pretty smash pick in the second round. I mean, Dirk Coder's back. Like, they're going to throw a shitload. And I think he's playing 11 games in the fucking dome this year. So, you know, Matt Ryan's going to smash. And like, look, I get the, I get the Calvin Ridley hype. And like, everyone's like, holy shit, Calvin Ridley's going to get all the targets. Austin Hooper left, Muhammad Sanu left. But like, what about Julio, man? Like, Julio, Julio could realistically, you know, challenge for top spot in targets this year as well. Yeah, I think you made a good point with the quarterbacks as well. Like, you know, what's funny about, the difference in Superflex, the one quarterback leagues this year, and I've noticed it at such a big disparity, is those second tier quarterbacks, the Dax and the Kylers, they go like five to six picks behind whoever the last of the first two guys is. But in one quarterback leagues, they go like five or six rounds later. Yeah. And I'm like, there's value to be had in one quarterback leagues because of that oh, disparity. Yeah. And I'm, I'm very much on the uh, quantity over quality bandwagon when it comes to redraft Superflex, as long as like, quality has some kind of cutoff there like obviously you don't want to be like double stacking nick Foles, mitch trubisky <laughs> no you waiting for me to say it <laughs> i actually muted my like, I saw, his, I saw his shit just like clench up and he was waiting for me to throw down the chargers <laughs> fucking beat baby uh, no but you know what i mean like I'm, I'm very much a get a three quality guys that are like quarterback 10 to 18 yeah the mid the mid tier, the mid to low tier of the mid tier of quarterback. So um, that's I'm I'm loading up the skill positions in the first few rounds. So yeah, I'm I'm I've come around to the fact that like you know what, end of the second round, you're not really gonna have a choice of trying to grab value from anyone. You're gonna be out of the running for the second tier of running backs and wide receivers. Just get the guy you like. Like fuck ADP at that point. Just get the best yeah. receivers you like. I find myself grabbing Godwin at like the two ten, two eleven. Often if I have that spot, I find myself grabbing 
uh, even Allen Robinson at like a three, two, if, if I'm sitting there or if uh, uh, Travis Kelsey or George Kill or something at the three, one, three, two. So, um, I mean, you just kind of have to make the best of it and run with it there. Yeah. Like when you're picking from the ends, like you can't be worried about capturing value. That's not, that's not how you play the ends. You like, if you're doing that, you're just waiting and you're going to miss it here every single time. So you're going to have to reach sometimes. And that's totally fine because like you have CMC and like the, the whole point of picking from the front end is like, is maybe you can even start some of those runs yourself and try and get the value on the back end. But when you're picking from the ends, you can't be too concerned about getting value. I just want to go back to that point that you made for one QB leagues. And it's, it's so true this year. You have this in these best ball leagues that I'm doing, like I'm in like 140 right now, but there's, there's a tier of Deshaun Watson, Russell Wilson and Dak Prescott. And they're consistently going like anytime they're there in the seventh round, I'm hitting the butt draft button because Same. because if you want it, people say like fade quarterback, fade quarterback, but here's the thing. Like, Deshaun Watson is going to score you higher points above replacement than whatever shitty wide receiver or running back you're picking there. So like, even more true in redraft leagues where where it's super flex, where you don't have the luxury of like, I mean, sorry, not super flex, or super single QB, like those guys are going to give you the advantage you need. Like Deshaun Watson, Russell Wilson, Dak Prescott, you, like you said, right? Like five round discount to Lamar Jackson and Patrick Mahomes. I'm not sure, so sure Deshaun Watson doesn't finish the QB1 this year. I'm not so sure that Dak Prescott doesn't challenge that. All of so. them have the ceiling that the top, like, listen, Patrick Mahomes could throw for 5,000 yards, but, like, Dak also just almost literally threw for 5,000 yards. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, like, in a passing floor ceiling, no one's going to have the rushing kind of thing that Lamar Jackson has going on. Yeah. But these guys are not, like, the normal Tier 2 quarterbacks. Like, these are not the Matt Ryans and the Josh Allens and the Carson Wentz. These guys are also elite but it just so happens Mahomes and Lamar Jackson are so fucking elite that you don't look at them in the same sense. So, yeah, I, Deshaun Watson, I'm not as high on as you are. But for some, some reason, because he falls to the end of the seventh every time, he's my, he's my second most owned quarterback in the underdog basketball draft because yeah. there's too much value to, to not be had there. Yeah, and yeah, just looking at their ADP, they're going from pick 64 to 75. We have Dak Prescott at 64, Kyler at 72, Deshaun Watson at 74, Russell Wilson at 75. And then the players around them, like Ronald Jones, Nick, I know you like him, but he obviously has question marks. Uh, T.Y. Hilton, is that guy still, like, healthy? Will Fuller, same thing. Marquise Brown, uh, Julian Edelman we like, but, like, Tariq Cohen, A.J. Green, James White, all these guys are not going to be running back ones or wide receiver ones at their respective positions, whereas Dak Prescott, Kyler, Deshaun, and Russell Wilson, as you guys said, have very safe floors because of their legs, but also have extremely high ceilings because we know that they have arm talent as well. Yeah, if one of those top two quarterbacks, like, doesn't win MVP, it's going to be someone in that – range of those four quarterbacks so I'm just like yeah we like to fade quarterback but also when you have an option that you see like smash the button on that so um let's talk about I guess the I almost think like the middle middle draft picks and the end of the round draft picks are kind of identical this year uh my strategy is is likely double tapping on the running backs if I'm anywhere from pick like six through 12. I, I, I particularly like where, where are your guys favorite spot to draft from if you're in a 12 team league and they give you the option to draft from where are you choosing 101. <laughs> I, I like that as well. I think the cutoff for me are, is around 106 because I want one of those top six running backs. Yeah. Once you get to like Clyde Edwards Hilaire, I, I do like his talent a lot and I like his situation, but I still feel like there's a lot of question marks. I think the top six guys, because I'm not going to draft Michael Thomas, I think those top six guys all have as little question marks as possible. I guess Dalvin Cook with his health and his holdout concerns, there's some worry to be had there, but I just think CMC, Saquon, Zeke, Kamara, Cook, and Henry. If you can start that way, and then I, I guess if you're at the 106, you have a chance at like an Aaron Jones or Nick Chubb and then a wide receiver thereafter. But I just think that they're super safe in terms of production, and you get an elite player at a very thin position. Yeah, if I had yeah. to choose, if I had to choose, I just chose actually, like I had like a home keeper league um, that I drafted the, for this past weekend, and I chose the 106. And part of that is because I traded away my third round picks. I didn't want to take like a 102 and then fucking fuck myself on the way back on a late yeah. fourth. Uh, so like I chose 106 because I have like six running backs and it's CMC, Barkley, Zeke, Kamara, Cook, and CH. And I want to get one of those guys. And when you're in the middle, there's a chance that you have some idiots in your league that like to hit on Austin Eckler and he somehow makes it back to you in the middle. And especially if you're in super flex, so you're going to have Lamar Jackson and Patrick Mahomes going there. Cause right now he's going at 16th overall. So if you push him to 18th overall with, with Mahomes and, and, uh, and Lamar Jackson, like if you get a CEH or like Dalvin Cook plus Eckler open, I think that's the nuts. And that's what I've been getting in a couple of best balls. Dude, so on Yahoo, they have they have their pro leagues on Yahoo, right? So you could join them and you're just playing with random people, but you could do buy-ins of 20, 50, 100, 250, 500, and 1,000. And I've done two separate 250 buy-ins. They're only 10-team leagues. So it's you versus nine other people. In the drafts, I got the 101 in one of my drafts and I got CMAC. 
Austin Eckler fell to me at the last pick of the second round, and then Travis Kelsey also fell to me in the third <laughs> round. So C-Mac, Eckler, uh, Kelsey. So for real, if people are trying to get into like last minute drafts and want to pay and take take advantage of some ADPs, my, I remember my six seven stack was like it was like Tyler Lockett and uh, Tyler Lockett and and Tyler Boyd or some shit like that. It was like ridiculous players were falling to you. So the team ended up being stacked. Austin Eckler fell to like the twenty sixth spot in the. And the next draft I was in, I almost got Sanders with my third round pick. So, like, if anyone's looking for other fucking drafts to join in, do that. And I guess I agree with you that the middle round's great because you get that really, really solid RB1 and still have a chance. I still feel like I think I would probably take the 109, 110. I don't see a massive drop off between uh, CEH and guys like Josh Jacobs or Miles Sanders. And then give me the higher likelihood of getting another running back like a. Uh, Kenyon Drake or you know a Miles Sanders or Josh Jacobs on the way back and solidify me at the RB spot and then smash wide receivers rounds three four five so my ideal spot would be the end of the round but I'm probably taking the the same strategy as um, as I would in the middle rounds I'm looking to grab my RB one and then see I guess what falls to me back at the RB two spot but if you're sitting there in the middle of the round in the second round after you go you know you pick the five six seven slot like is there any way that you're looking at a Travis Kelsey or a George Kill because in my in my opinion like I don't know. You could throw all the value over replacement arguments or whatever the fuck you want to do with me. I just, I'm not, I'm just not going to hit the fucking yeah. button on him. I'm just not going to do it. I can't do it. And the reason why I can't do it is because Zach Ertz is going to be there in like the, the fourth or like even sometimes Andrew's there the in fifth. the fourth is Zach Ertz. Yeah. In the fifth. Like uh, it's, and then if I miss on them, I'm like, it's redraft, right? It's redraft where you can stream tight ends. So if I miss on them, I'll just stream. So I think, I think that's kind of my approach. Uh, the only time I've ever taken a tight end like Kittle or Kelsey, like in the New York uh, league, is when these fall into like the third or like potentially the fourth. Like when there's actual value, I'm probably not going to take them at value just because like you can stream and you can fire like later on darts. And that just like yeah, totally changes it. I think that's a good point. Like if you're taking one of those guys, you have to make sure that you're getting it at a value. Like don't take them with the idea that like he's going to be your league winner. Only take yeah. him if you're like, holy shit, he fell to me all the way. You know, if you're at like the 206, that's not a spot where you're like, oh my God, he fell to me all the way here. If you're at the 306, you're like, okay, he shouldn't still be on the fucking board. So I think that's the way you should look at it. Yeah, yeah I feel the same way about tight ends. And almost similarly, I feel the same way about Michael Thomas. Like I don't see in the first round – it sounds stupid. Like I'd, I'd much rather have almost like 10 running backs above Michael Thomas just because wide receiver is so deep. And of course he's probably going to be a top two or three option and put up like 1600 yards and 10 touchdowns. But when you look at like, I know it's a, it's a far cry from what his production is going to be, but like a Tyler Boyd, as you were saying, like you got him at the seventh round or like even a Julian Edelman, obviously they're not going to put up as lofty of numbers, but when you can get that in the sixth or seventh round, as opposed to burning a first round pick on Michael Thomas, when instead you can get a CEH, a Miles Sanders, Joe Mixon, Josh Jacobs, Nick Chubb, I just realistically don't see myself pulling the trigger on him at all. Yeah. I mean, like, I, I can't do it either. I'm, I'm like you. I have, like, I'll take, you know, I'll take, like, Derrick Henry. I'll take Miles Sanders. I'll take Kenyon Drake. I mean, honestly, if push came to shove, if I knew I could not get Eckler in the second round, I would take Eckler ahead of Michael Thomas, and I would not feel bad at, about it at all. So the video that I'm putting out tomorrow well, for the people watching right now is the one that went out Monday. It was my, my top 50 rankings. I kind of just like went through them and looked at which ones I'm higher ADP ECR. And like, I got to, I had Michael Thomas ranked like 10 or 11 overall. And I was like, yeah, Michael Thomas is in the first round, just like purely out of respect, but I'm not <laughs> taking him there. You know what I mean? Like that was, that was like the only analysis I can give to it. Cause I'm, I'm the same way with you guys. Like I'm not taking Michael Thomas with my first round pick just because that it, this year more than ever, I don't know if maybe it's just the fact that like people are getting sharper and like I'm getting better at as a fantasy player or just this year in particular, but like the game theory for this year is just so sound to fade wide receivers. Cause it is, and I brought this up before, I'm sure by the end of next summer or by the beginning of next summer, when we start analysis again, it's going to be like, Oh, well things swung back to the median in the market, right? Like we had 25 wide receivers, go for over a thousand receiving yards last year. So to us, it triggers this thing like, oh, it's so deep in the wide receiver two, wide receiver three pool. That was the highest number of thousand yard receiving seasons, you know, in one single season over the last like 25 years. So that's not going to happen again. So next year, are we like, ah, it's really not that deep. You know, it's like, it's like the 2016 zero RB phase and like shit like that. You know, it always swings to one side of the spectrum. And then by the next year, we look at things differently. So I'm wondering like, do we go, do we continue seeing this trend where it's like, we want running backs early and often? Is it, you know, do you think it's like a product of just having so many workhorses in the league right now? Do you think that the wide receiver two, three pool is actually this deep or is it just a phase of what happened last year? Yeah. I, look, I think, 
I don't think we're going to have that many again, but I think wide receiver, like over combined these like two to three years is still going to be way deeper than compared to like 10 years ago, because you don't ha- you just don't have target hog like wide receivers anymore. And the reason why is because teams like spread it out, like the offensive yeah. philosophy has changed. So like, it's really hard to compare today versus like 10 years ago, because even like read the draft, like I, I honestly think that Jonathan Taylor had even drafted 10 years ago, he'd been a top five pick that that's like my honest truth. Um, but like the, the game is like changed so much. Like the offenses have shifted so much. Like you have like legitimate wide receiver too. The, the talent coming in at wide receiver is just like insane. Like CD lamb is joining an offense and like you could make the argument that he's like the third in targets. I'm not making that argument, but I'm saying that you can, because you have yeah. Gallup and you have Cooper. Right. So I, I think there will be some regression, but I don't think we'll ever regress to the point w- that it was before where you have like these massive, like Antonio Brown, like Julio Jones, Michael Thomas, like all of them all at the top. Uh, I just think that like, I think that the ball is going to get spread out more, just like how there's, there's a decrease in like bell, true bell cows running backs. You're going to see like that decrease in, uh, in wide receiver target hogs kind of hold. I'm going to stop you right there. We talked about the balls getting spread around. You know whose balls are about to get spread around (laughs) post-COVID? Y'all, because we've got a special – I shouldn't do the kiss thing when I'm talking about shaving man's balls. (laughs) But listen, we're working on that part. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Listen, listen. COVID's about to be done. Not really. We probably got another couple years. But things are starting to open up again, which means we get to go out. We get to meet people. We get to – we get to have women catch more balls than Julio Jones catches, <laughs> right? And when we put ourselves in that situation, we want to make sure we are ready. And there is nothing more equipped to have you ready than Manscaped's Lawn Mower 3.0. They got this beautiful kit. I'm just going to keep this in the background. Your balls will thank you. I can't really put it any better than this, than the package says right here. They've got this kit that comes with ball toner, ball deodorant, the lawnmower, which comes with a flashlight. Now, I was thinking about doing something where I shaved my face, like, on camera to show you how good it was. But I shaved my balls with this in the shower the other day. Low-key, the best part about this thing is that it's waterproof, water-resistant. So you shave in the shower, and you don't got to worry about breaking it, you know, two days, three days at a time. Rip it up, shave it up, go out there, let somebody catch your balls, all right? That is my proposition to you. Get in your shower, shave your balls, go look good now that we're out congregating with other people. If you go to manscaped.com and you use the promo code BDGE, you're getting 20% off your lawnmower and you're getting free shipping. What do we think? Dude, I mean, I've been using that shit for a while. So definitely you got to You got to shave your balls, man. I mean, if nothing else, like for, for your, for your lady, for yourself, just have the have some fucking self, have some self-respect, man. Don't be walking around there with a bush. Like it's 1980s. Like we don't need that. No, have that. you have you shaved any part of your body over the last <laughs> six, six months? Can you tell? <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I see a little, I see a little bit of beard action going on over there. Yeah, uh, the other thing, this too, I, I don't I don't typically shave my balls, but the 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 lawnmower is like very anti uh, scratch resistant. I don't know what the right Nick word is. For it. Shaving. Not chafing, but like it doesn't cut you up. Like you oh, yeah, get yeah. you up extremely close to your hair and it doesn't cut you up. Whereas like any other buzzer is it's really, really risky yeah. fucking yeah. business. Yeah, it'll 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 rip your it'll fuck some other some other shavers, man, it'll rip your fucking pubes off. Like it it's happened before and that shit hurts. So Yeah, before yeah. you know it, yeah, your your fucking nutsack is, <laughs> is looking like it just got chopped up by a machine. So grab the lawnmower again, manscaped.com. BDGE, the promo code, 20% off plus free shipping. All right, let's get back to catching real balls, footballs. What were we talking about? Yeah, we were, oh, we were in round two. <laughs> round two, I think. Um, I mean, Jesus look, Christ. I think like, yeah, we're talking about like the wide receivers, right? And like the reason why we tell you to fade wide receivers early and like the, the thing is like it's going to get to a point where like people are going to push that like way too far. We're like, if you're in a league, right, and you're sitting there at the second round and like, Basically, people have taken, like, Aaron Jones and, like, Nick Chubb, Austin Eckler, James Conner. I've seen James Conner go in the second round. And you're looking at, like, a plethora of, like, elite wide receivers. Like, you have to, like, click the button then. So, like, it's all – like, I kind of tweeted this before. Like, people always, like, talk about, like, promote their stuff. Like, oh, like, this guy won, like, high-stakes championships. This guy won expert leagues. Like, yo, newsflash. Most people aren't playing with fucking experts or playing high-stakes leagues or playing in home leagues. So, like, implementing some, like, fancy zero-RB strategy is fucking dumb because – like, people aren't drafting, like, how experts draft. So, you really got to just feel out your draft. And, like, sometimes 
like when I was doing my most recent like homely, like playing vanilla, just taking like good value that falls to you, like it works. Like it just works. And you end up with like a pretty fucking slick team. Most home leagues, like I'm sure some of the ones that you guys are playing in, like like they don't even like aren't that aware of rookies. So that's why you can get guys like DeAndre Swift and Cam Akers in like the fifth and sixth round. Whereas like realistically speaking, they should be going in like the fourth. So like I just, I, I just like always try and play like the value that falls to me. Um, but like in the first round, like you kind of just have to hit the cop button on the running back. Second round is where you can kind of get more flexible. Yeah. It's but, uh, too. I feel like there's such a steep drop off once you get to that James Conner range, because at that point, people that don't have their second running back want to push the button on a James Conner or a Chris Carson who has injury concerns or a Todd Gurley who just has every concern in the world about him. And instead, you, if you already have your running back or you have two running backs, you can push the button on an Amari Cooper or a DJ Moore or a Juju Smith-Schuster or an Adam Thielen, all guys who have legitimate top five wide receiver upside, whereas the running backs I just mentioned, like I don't think they have top five upside overall just because they have so many concerns about them. And I think in a perfect world, like a guy like Todd Gurley is probably going to he's going to top out at like the RB 10 as he did last year because he just fell his way into 14 touchdowns was terribly inefficient and is now in an offense that doesn't like to run the ball as much as LA did. Yeah. I think one of like the key uh, things to get right this season, Mike talked about was those rookie running backs. I think they're going to be like the deciding factor for a lot of leagues this year, because we have people going so crazy for the running back position. And now we have, you know, that, that jump up to where people are like, Oh dude, there's nothing left on the board. Do I still go running back, running back? If I'm at the two eleven, and it's just like Fournette or Chris Carson, I'm like, listen, like we, the reason that you have the strategy there that it's so popular is because we know which players that usually fall there. So it's like the strategy is based on, on the players that are available to us this year that we know about. And now it gets tricky when you have these rookies thrown into place that we're not really sure about their role, but they're super exciting. They're like these prospects that we haven't seen a, a group of like upper echelons talent like this, I think come out in a long time that we're all like universally excited about the top five guys are all in interesting spots. Um, so in terms of the rookie running backs, like we, we've talked about this a little bit on the show, but from like a strategy standpoint, are you, uh, are you looking to target a certain rookie? Are you looking to target a certain number of them? Because I said this before, like with J.K. Dobbins, he's someone that I'll probably only target if I miss out on all of the other rookie running backs because I don't want a guy sitting on my bench for a long time. But I do think one or two of these guys is going to hit and they're going to hit in a big fucking way. Yeah, I'm not like going all out on rookie running backs. I mean, the only time I have done that is when I was forced to go like zero RB in some of the best ball drafts where I'll just double click on acres and swift. Yeah. Um, but outside of that, what I'll usually do, especially when I'm picking from like early on, like the CMC bit Barkley range, uh, it's harder to get swift on those unless you want to reach, like you said, like I said, in the fifth round at five Oh one. Um, but if you don't want to do that, you want to get like wide receivers or quarterbacks there. What you can do is get J.K. Dobbins on like the way back. So that, that's kind of where I've been getting J.K. Dobbins a lot of. Um, and I, I think like like you said, you have to have a balance, right? Because not all of these guys are going to step on the field and have a role right away. Like I think the ones that will is someone like Cam Akers, one, because he's healthy. Two, you know, Darrell Henderson and, and, and Malcolm, Malcolm Brown are kind of jags. And also Darrell Henderson is, is hurt. So yeah. I think he's going to have a lot of opportunity. He's someone where like, I would feel like pretty comfortable like slotting into my like flex or like RB2. He might not put up like great numbers to start, but he'll, he's not going to like sink your week because he's going to get a lot of touches. So that's like, that's one where I feel like is, is a decent value. And if Swift wasn't injured, like if he wasn't hurt at all, uh, I'd be like more comfortable slotting him in week one. But you've heard the camp reports now where like, you know, he's missing time and you got like Matt Patricia who's a freaking idiot. So, you know, he's I'm, I'm nervous about Swift. Back. The injury is definitely making me nervous about him. Yeah, so you kind of got to be prepared to, like, not have him there for, like, the first first few weeks. Uh, not few weeks, like, first, like, two to three, maybe four weeks. So I think that's how you got to plan for it. And, like, not not few weeks, just two to three to four. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's a fucking definition of a few. <laughs> Dude, I thought I, – okay, I thought a few was, like, five plus. But, yeah, I don't want to make it sound like half the season's gone. But, you know, a couple weeks to uh, three weeks. But, yeah, I think – Like, aren't you, like, a math major? <laughs> yeah, only, only on my diploma. <laughs> <laughs> only technically <laughs> yeah um, yeah so the yeah the rookie running backs are an interesting case study for this year. i'm really excited to like i'm almost excited for the season to be done just to see like all the shit we got wrong and right yeah i'm expecting 100 percent hit rate from us another 100%. year of derrick henry and michael thomas being faded that's gonna bite me right in the ass <laughs> <laughs> beautiful yeah i think the interesting thing is if you look at the third and fourth round and you know people always say like this is the running back dead zone and, like, you don't really know what that means. But if you just look at them, 
like you know that the what's driving that ADP is people that are like, fuck, I did not get a running back in rounds one and two. Because if you look at the names, it's like James Conner at 25th overall, so top of the third round. Like, you know, Chris Carson in the middle of the third round. Is Todd that crazy? Gurley. Is that fucking crazy that that's, Connor's going at the 301? That's I I think I think it's uh I don't, I think that one's less crazy than like Carson and Gurley because we've at least seen like James Connor's like top five upside. Because yeah. if you assume he stays healthy, then like cool. But like it, it's wild to me that Chris Carson's going in the middle of the third, that Todd Gurley's going towards the end of the third, and you got like Leonard Fournette there as well. And you got Melvin Gordon in the fourth, Le'Veon Bell and David Johnson in the fourth as well. I think like those that's like the that's what's driving that is people that literally missed out on the top running backs. I'm like, wow, I cannot leave these rounds with zero running backs and like head into like round five or six and just rely on rookies and, and dart throws. I think that's Which, what's driving that. Connor was like literally a fifth round pick like three weeks ago. And I yeah. don't like nothing changed in that <laughs> backfield. Right. Like maybe Mike yeah. Tomlin came out and was like, James Connor's our starter. And everyone was like, <laughs> Oh my fucking God. I think cause you've been hyping Anthony McFarland. They're like, Oh fuck. He's the next justice. Hill. I think James <laughs> Connor's the guy now. Yeah, dude, maybe that was part of it too. But like, that's what I mean. It's like you get these guys that are pushed up and we historically know that that round, you know, some, there are a lot of running backs around three that do end up hitting, but like four, five, six, those are the guys that end up getting pushed into three, four, five and become the actual dead zone for it. And that's why I'm so high on getting these running backs in rounds one and two and then pairing them with an RB three, four in the game makers, DeAndre Swift, Ronald Jones, uh, you know, fucking – mold uh, somebody fucking help me out here <laughs> I, don't know so what hard. <laughs> I don't know what you're what trying to say for either it was so bad that might have been the worst blank i've, I've had on <laughs> on film in my life yeah. but i mean if time you just left look at this episode i'm sure i'll top you <laughs> you, you already fucking left you quit get off the screen <laughs> i quit like two minutes in when you started talking about fucking justin herbert yeah. and like justin jackson yeah, yeah but i, I mean agree if you just i think that whole like James Conner, Chris Carson, Todd Gurley. That's like the nostalgia range. People are just picking these guys because they missed out on the on the previous running backs. They're like, wow, Todd Gurley was like the RB1 in 2014. That's like – I like that. The nostalgia ago. range. Yeah, the nostalgia. Yeah. that in that. Yeah, the nostalgia <laughs> range. Love it's that. so true. I almost feel better about like taking Cam Akers at 53 over, I guess, like a Todd Gurley at 33. Not just ADP-wise, but I feel like almost better about Cam Akers than Todd Gurley this year. It might sound crazy, but like – once you get past that nostalgia range, which I just I just sent in the patent, it's being it's pending right now. Shark Tank is <laughs> taking a look at it. But I like the Cam Akers, Kareem Hunt, Mark Ingram, and even though DeAndre Swift is injured right now, I like that range a lot better than the guys we previously mentioned because, number one, they're old. Number two, I know you guys love to hear it, most of them are kind of fat. And number three, none of them are efficient. <laughs> so I don't expect any sort of production there. Why not just take a Calvin Ridley, Adam Thielen, A.J. Brown, Robert Woods, wait around, and then get yourself a Cam Akers? Yeah. Yeah, I think I think if you just look at the running backs versus the wide receivers in that range, I look at the wide receivers and I see like top end wide receiver one upside. Like Adam Thielen, if he finishes top five, I would not be shocked. That's Calvin exactly Ridley. exactly what I said in the video I filmed this morning too. Yeah. I was like, it's, it's just there's you look at him as a floor play, but like there's legitimate yeah. ceiling as well. Yeah, Cal- Calvin Ridley, like that's getting a little bit hype. But if if any happens to Julio, like he's in a smash. But even without Julio, I could see him. I could see that tandem being wide receiver ones. But like more importantly, like Robert Woods, we know Cooper Cup has now sustained an ankle injury. If Robert Woods finishes wide receiver five overall, I would not be fucking shocked in the least. So you see the upside there versus the running backs. You just don't see it. And the only way to like like trick your mind into thinking these guys have have upside is like look back into a year that is like no longer like the most recent year. So guys like David Johnson, when he said he would go 1000 for 1000, we're still waiting for that shit. And it's not going to happen this year. Yeah, Mike, Le'Veon, you jumped out of that pool that one time. That was pretty <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I'm yeah. pretty sure he said it again, like a week ago. Like, he, <laughs> he did. Uh, he did. He still <laughs> he said did, he's right? still chasing that 1000, 1000 season. And dude, good luck to you, man. Keep on chasing. I hope you do well, but I'm not betting on it. You got Le'Veon Bell. He's got fucking Gase back there. And you got beat reporters saying, you know, Frank Gore looks better than Le'Veon Bell and all this shit. Bro. I never <laughs> the, reports, for the, re- the reports for Le'Veon Bell have been out of control this summer. <laughs> like nothing good. I'm yeah. like, dude, how can anyone still even remotely think about drafting him inside the top like five rounds? It makes yeah. no fucking sense. Exactly. So, yeah. So I think running back early, and then I think the sweet spot comes back again in like the sixth, seventh round, where you can get your RB threes and fours, grab your wide receivers in the middle. Uh, let's talk about quarterbacks a little bit for the super flex because where we talked about how we're not really looking to target the top guys unless they probably fall to value, maybe like a third round or something like that. But typically that's not going to happen. So 
of the guys that are like that quarterback two tier that I named, like the Matt Ryan, Josh Allen, Carson Wentz, I'm almost like they're not worth drafting because you can get guys that are statistically going to put up, you know, how many, how, how many fewer yards is Drew Brees or Tom Brady going to throw than Matt Ryan is probably like a hundred, right? And their touchdowns are probably going to be similar. So wait two rounds, grab one of those guys. So I'm, I'm looking to grab like the middle to low tier of the middle tier of quarterbacks, you know, as my first quarterback in Superflex. Yeah, that that's kind of where I'm at too. Is like, you know, I, I'm hoping that I can get Tannehill as my QB two. That's like my goal of every draft. But if not, like Tannehill, Tannehill and Cousins pairing, uh, I think is like probably my favorite uh, in terms of like value because when I just looked at the Vikings, like how their schedule is going to be, like they are they're facing really tough offenses. Um, so that means that the opposing team's going to score a lot and but they are facing opponents with very low defensive efficiency. So like you're going to get shootouts and you're, I think you need something more reminiscent of like Kirk Cousins, uh, 20, 2018, I guess it was. So I think those are a couple of guys and you got like Gardner Minshew as well, but I agree with you. Like I'm targeting the lower end of that tier and hopefully filling out my running backs and wide receivers up top. And then just like getting that, you know, getting that like mid medium floor play on the QBs that, some do have ceilings. It's like I think Ryan Tannehill has a ceiling, but mostly looking for the floor and super flex. Yeah, just looking at the ADP, a guy like even Matthew Stafford or Daniel Jones, they're going right after that or in that range of the nostalgia running backs, I guess, with Chris Carson, David Johnson, and then DeAndre Swift is going a little bit later. I'd much rather take a chance on one of those quarterbacks, have them as my QB1, wait a few rounds, as Mike was saying, get yourself a Tannehill, get yourself a Minshew, and then wait a round or two after that. And as your QB3, I'm fine with like a Derek Carr there. And then if you want to pick up like Tyrod Taylor or Ryan Fitzpatrick, uh, Ryan Fitzpatrick, as I said earlier, at like an extreme discount as a QB4 or QB3 if you miss out on Derek Carr, I think that's a good, a good blend of floor and ceiling at the quarterback position because a guy like Minshew or a guy like Tannehill give you, gives you the rushing upside, whereas somebody like Matthew Stafford, you know he's going to throw for like 4,500 yards and 25 to 30 touchdowns if he's healthy, or Daniel Jones who's going to give you something on the ground, turn the ball over a hell of a lot, but also have a lot of opportunities to make up for that with touchdowns and uh, rushing upside. So that's how I would try to attack the quarterback position. And as you guys said earlier, it's like, I mean, Mahomes is really good. Lamar Jackson, I've, I've heard he's pretty good too. But <laughs> to me, it's just, it's super hard to pass up on the running back position early when you know you can get a quarterback like a Matthew Stafford, like a Daniel Jones, like a Drew Brees, like you said, a lot later, whereas the running backs in that range have, they don't hold a candle to a Christian McCaffrey, a Saquon Barkley, and Ezekiel Elliott. Yeah, the drop off is so big. And, and one of the terms I like to use, that I, I, I talked about in, uh, in the Bible this year was uh, the least viable starter. So the way I look at super flex leagues for redraft is like, if you're looking at rankings for a one quarterback league, like what's the, la the last guy in the ranking sheet that you're comfortable starting in your quarterback spot, right? It might be quarterback. 16 it might be quarterback 18 for so for super flex you should look at it the same way that guy if you're comfortable starting one quarterback you'd obviously be comfortable starting him in a super flex just make sure you get one guy that's ranked above him right so if quarterback 18 is the last guy that you're comfortable in one quarterback league jump in and grab someone that's a spot above it doesn't have to be the quarterback five in the quarterback 18 it could be the quarterback 14 and the quarterback 18 or something like that yeah, one thing I will say, though, is in Superflex, like quarterback floor matters much more, whereas in single QB, floor doesn't matter at all. Like if I, if I pick a Daniel Jones and he busts, like I just drop him. I grab someone else off the waiver wire. You're not going to be able to do that in Superflex, which is why like I, I, I prioritize safety a lot more. Uh, so like I actually – I'm actually like pretty wary about like Daniel Jones because like you're not going to be able to really use him in the beginning of the year. His season is absolutely brutal. Uh, so like – you know, and from that sense, like I'm really looking for guys with safer floors. Why I really love like Tannehill. It's why I really like uh, like Kirk Cousins. I think they have like pretty safe floors with like decent enough ceilings to get you by. Uh, you know, so I think that's the one distinction I'll make between a uh, single QB. And no, that's a good point because you don't have the luxury of if someone who's risky ends up, you know, assuming that risk and not being able to start be a starter for your team, you can't go to the waiver wire because they're not available in super flex leagues. Yeah. I was looking at the ADP again. Are you guys ever going to draft Aaron Rodgers? I'm no. looking at this guy. He's in between Stafford and Daniel Jones. I just like – I know it's like a very niche subject. It's just one player. But I think he's just the Derrick Henry of quarterbacks for me where I'm just never going to draft this guy. I feel like he's too rich for my blood, and he hasn't been good really since like 2017. I'll draft Rodgers if the narrative – if this narrative is strong enough into the draft that like he actually falls to quarterback 15 or 16. Like he's someone within that viable range of starters for me in a super flex. Not someone I'm targeting. But if I'm sitting there and I'm like, I need another quarterback and it's literally like Aaron Rodgers or it's, you know, fucking like Derek Carr, or Gardner Minshew, like I'm going to take Aaron Rodgers there. He's not that bad. And he's shown games where he has that ceiling still. 
And like maybe the pissed off narrative is real. Who knows? Aaron Rodgers is a piece of shit and he's like <laughs> very angry all the time. And I feel like sometimes, you know, you play angry, you might play well and put up big stats. So he's not like a necessarily completely off my off my fucking board, I, I don't think, but um definitely not someone I'm I'm targeting this year. Yeah, he's QB thirteen, so I probably won't land any of him. And even by home league, like someone took him in like pretty early so i think like the name brand is still pretty strong especially in your traditional man i love my home league he's been a second round pick for like the past five years (laughs) it's it's incredible the packers made it so hard to to draft rogers like he could it would have been great because they could have drafted or brought in like multiple free agents they could have they could have brought in a free agent and drafted a a talented rookie wide receiver and the narrative would still be the same and that's when you would have liked to have drafted rogers like people would be like oh rogers is bad he fell off he's not like talented anymore and then you would have been able to get him at quarterback 14 and been like yeah he's probably gonna have a pretty good year but they did you're you're just relying on Devontae adams to go absolutely fucking nuclear this year and if that doesn't happen then he doesn't have anyone to throw to. I mean, even even if Adams has like 200 targets, like 1,500 yards, and like 18 touchdowns, I'm still not sure like, like how much how much yeah. value Rogers is going to bring because you're you're throwing to like Alan Lazard and like Marquez Valdez. Like what they could have done is they could have brought in Perriman and he could have been like a wide receiver two three, and then they could have drafted someone. Like that's what that's what I I imagine happening. Any deep threat, any yeah. fucking deep. Like imagine imagine they yeah like imagine they draft uh, they took Brashad Perriman and then like got. Levin Chanel for the line yeah. like dude that yeah. would that would have been fucking deadly for Rodgers. yeah exactly but they didn't and now you have alan lazard and, and now on the, this camp yeah. so yeah. so yeah um nick remember oh. earlier in the show you said you can't wait for the season to end so we can see like what we were wrong about remember A-Rod, last Q-B1? year for like five months we were debating between mvs and geronimo allison and both of them just fucking stopped. <laughs> yeah that was that was that was like one of the more popular uh arguments amongst fantasy football twitter it was so good and it was so it was so funny because no matter what side you were on you were so sure that you were right about it <laughs> there were, one side was gonna win no doubt about it and then yeah, everyone just ended up lost. Fucking tanking. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so i mean coming out of the fifth coming out of the fifth if you land like someone like an acres and deandre swift you're you're probably gonna flip back to like wide receiver i think that's another great value range where you have guys like Devonte parker michael gallup uh, Marquise Brown, like Tyler Boyd, Jarvis Landry, like you're you're gonna be able to land some of these guys. So that's where you're gonna backfill in your wide receiver three. And like I think, like the, again, just like those all those guys, like I would not be shocked if any one of them finishes like a wide receiver one uh, this year. So it's just like a great spot. Um, that's usually where I'm like coming out with another wide receiver uh, if I don't land someone like a uh, Deshaun Watson or Russell Russell Wilson. Um, so I don't know how you guys are approaching like that like seven to eight range, but that's usually where I'm at. I feel the same way, but I also feel like in that range is where it's the final call for tight ends. And if I miss on any of these guys and don't have a tight end to that point, I think I'm fine just streaming afterwards. So I think around Hayden Hurst, which he's going 82nd overall as a tight end nine. After that, like, I don't feel like sinking draft capital into Hooper and Gesicki. Hawkinson's interesting, but he's like injured right now and he's on the Lions. Jared Cook, I like as well, but I think he's getting a little bit too rich for my blood when you can you know, if, if it is uh, one quarterback league, you can get a Matt Ryan or a Josh Allen at that point. Just draft Chris Herndon. That's really all you need to know. Just draft, <laughs> draft Chris Herndon in the 11th round. You'll be. I really think he's going to be this year's Darren Waller. Like, if you think about That's it, so. the Jets have no one to throw to right now. He's going to be forced into a 100, 110 targets. Like, it's only James called Jameson Crowder or nobody? Jameson, <laughs> Jameson Crowder is a poor man's Hunter Renfro. That's, yeah. what, wow. that's the way I look at it. Yeah. So Chris Herndon seems to be, like, the best value play at 11th round. But those, like, 7th through 10th round, I feel like I – uh, those are usually mixed with about two to three wide receivers. And it's some kind of mix of like the Tyler boys, Deontay Johnson's guys like that. And then sometimes I'll throw uh, a, a dart at like a Zach Moss in that range or like an Antonio Gibson, if he drops to the ninth. So I think that's like really last call for any sort of viable running back play. Once you get past like the eighth round, whoever you're taking at running back is going to put you up either zero or their their starting running back needs to get hurt in order for them to do anything so it's like if you don't have your running backs by then you're kind of fucked so make sure you have them there's still so much value at the wide receiver position it's crazy yeah I, i'm kind of with you guys the one guy i have been pulling trigger on is tj hawkinson and uh, uh in the middle of the like 10th or 11th round in superflex drafts he'll be in the ninth round in your traditional drafts but if you're worried about the injuries which is totally understandable like nick said you can kind of just wait a couple more rounds i wouldn't like pick up like a jared cook or a Mike Kosicki fucking stinks. Um, <laughs> or like even a Noah fan. I don't think it's enough volume. But yeah, you can get those later round guys. I, I, you guys mentioned uh, Chris Herndon. You know, I think he's like a good volume play. Someone that's going way later who I'm like kind of interested in though is, is Irv Smith. And he's going like way, way, way late where like if you have, 
I don't recommend like drafting two tight ends most of the time, but if you play in the deeper league, like my leagues are usually like 18 to 20 man rosters. That's when I'll like consider taking two shots on some of those late round darts. Uh, and Irv Smith is just like a tight end too with that target uh, way, way late into like the mid, I think it's like the 14th, 15th round. I was getting nervous that you're going to say you're taking a shot on Jimmy Graham because he's going super late. And I, I don't think he's like still in the NFL anymore. I think he's on the bears, but yeah, uh, I also like uh, Eric Ebron. He's going pretty late too. I know he's kind of a fraud and he can't really catch football. You like all that Ebron, well, dude. He's a- Snacks likes Ebron too. And I can't figure yeah. out why you guys like I don't him. like Ebron now. <laughs> yeah, I was, was going to say, I figured that would push pretty much all the audience off of him as well. <laughs> uh, I mean, I think people are like Ebron because he's really cheap and he's shown that he's like been that red zone presence. And honestly, once you get out of the top, top tight ends, like you want guys that can score a lot of TDs. And, you know, traditionally though, like Pittsburgh and Ben hasn't relied on their tight ends too much, but I, honestly like they are kind of lacking a little bit of that red zone weapon so i think that's that's part of the reason that drives it because like you know juju is not a not a big red zone threat deontay johnson not a big red zone threat chase claypool people wish that he is a red zone threat maybe he is i don't know i don't think he's that good so he kind of stinks but uh yeah i think ebron kind of fills that red zone threat for them so that's why people like him i think ebron makes sense he i think he would make sense if it wasn't vance mcdonald season <laughs> i think i think we've come full circle i'm going back like very quietly like 40 years old and has never had a season over like 200 yards <laughs> it's, it's always that season. that fucking 40 though that 40 yard dash time it's all because come he on. put like chris conti into like the underworld on that one stiff arm and that was like literally through. that was like 65 percent of his fantasy <laughs> production on one play for the entirety of the fucking year it was beautiful yeah but tight ends i'm i'm very much like the one draft I got Kelsey in because he fell to me at the 3-1. That's the only time you're going to see me grabbing the tight ends early. Otherwise, I'm doing a very similar approach to Mike where I would typically grab a Chris Herndon, a Jonu Smith, like one of those 10th round guys, pair him up right again with another like 10th, 11th kind of high upside guys. Because by that point in the draft, like we said, we're hammering running backs, we're hammering wide receivers, probably got one or two quarterbacks. And uh, that's where it's like plush to grab tight ends. So I think like as an overall strategy – like we kind of laid it out for you, what we're doing position by position. Are there any other like tips at the end of your draft? Is there like something yeah. that you target at? Yeah, you do at the, like, you know, 10th to 15th round or whatever. Yeah. So I think, I mean, this year in particular, like I think, I think handcuffs are like kind of interesting just because of COVID. Um, but like, I don't go and blow like two, three picks on handcuffs. Like that's not really a good use of your time. I usually just pick like one or two and I'll, uh, and you guys will, would have already heard me talk about handcuffing on uh, market watch Mondays. Um, but I think that's an interesting thing. And one of the things is like jerk McKinnon, I think, I think jerk McKinnon is someone that I've been leaving like pretty much every draft with, and he's someone that you can get in the double digit rounds. Uh, mainly because he's he's like the only one that can catch passes on the San Francisco team, and I know people like are scared of the the committee there, but like the fact remains like they just run a shitload. So like even that, even if you're part of a committee, you can get enough touches to be kind of viable, and he's cheap enough where like that's like a backfield that's murky enough where you have no idea who's going to be the running back one by the end of the year. All I know is that it won't be Tevin Coleman. So uh, like it's a good bet to make on someone like Jerry McKinnon, in my opinion. I think going off that handcuff thing, I want to say the people out there that play in a league with like kickers and defenses and shit, I would not occupy those spots until the very last moment that you have to. And that's like a normal thing, but especially this year, because we're going to have COVID tests every single day and you never know who's going to pop up positive on them. So if you're like in the last round and it's like choosing between uh, squeezing your kicker hole and your defensive spot in your lineup or like a Tony Pollard or a uh, Alexander Madison or even like a Boston Scott, I would take the running back because you actually never know what's going to happen with the COVID testing. And then like the last day where it's that Sunday morning where the waivers run, just put in a couple waivers for multiple kickers to make sure that you have one. But till the very last minute, make sure that you occupy any high upside uh, handcuff running backs. Yeah, my only tip, uh, I guess we'll leave on this note, is if you want this year's Jalen Samuels, somebody that has tight end eligibility, I think we all know who the best late round pick is. <laughs> somebody who can play quarterback and tight end and has very similar hair to what I got in the top of my head right Spices now. Spices and herbs, baby. Spices <laughs> and herbs. Yeah. Uh, oh, one more thing. You actually reminded me on defense. And I saw you tweet about this. And, like, uh, it's, it's something that I caught on, like, a little bit early on when I was doing FFPC best balls because you have to draft defenses there. But I left every single draft with Kansas City Chiefs. I think Same. the Kansas City Chiefs is going to be the best defense to own this year because – one, they're hella cheap, and, like, everyone thinks of the Chiefs, and they think they suck. But, like, the reality is their pass D was, was like, changed, like, completely when they added uh, Honey Badger. And basically, like, what you need from defense is this. 
play a bad quarterback. Like, so you look at their schedule and they played Deshaun Watson to start and they played Lamar Jackson week three. But after that, look at this, they face the chargers. So you got tight end one, Justin Herbert or Ty God, whichever one it is. You got a Cam Newton. We don't know if he's healthy or not, but they're playing at home, right? You have Derek Carr, you have Josh Allen, you have, uh, Drew Locke, you have Sam Darnold, you have Ooh. Teddy Bridgewater, you have Derek Carr again, you have Tom Brady behind Bucks O line. Like, we don't know how good they are. We have Drew Locke again, and then you have whoever between Tua and Fitz Magic. Like, that entire stretch, you don't have to change your defense or stream again. And I think they're just like, they're so fucking good. Even against the Sean Watson, he'll still be fine because they sat, they'll sack him a ton. Oh, and yeah. The Chiefs, the Chiefs blitz like, like crazy. Like they, they they run like cover zero and just blitz the shit out of you like like crazy and what happens is their offense puts up so many points it forces the other team into like very predictable passing uh passing tempo and what happens is like they just spag no, spags or whatever the fuck his name is all he does is a blitz you just watch their game like all they do is like all out blitz and that's perfect recipe for uh for defenses score defensive scoring in your traditional league so you just gotta you gotta get them uh I think I think like I picked the Patriots last year this is like this is the Patriots might not be like that OP of scoring, but this is like my Patriots pick of like 2020. Yeah. Simply put, it's like Patrick Mahomes is going to make every other team pass the ball a fuck ton. Like you said, their defense is going to know that anytime the other team passes the ball a lot, it means sacks. It means strip sacks. It means forced fumbles. It means interceptions. It means pick sixes. It means six fucking points for your fantasy defense. And it means a dub. So chiefs defense, second to last round of every draft Mark it down. He that's We're going to target man. some that's kickers because I, I know one that's really good. <laughs> I don't yeah. know any. I love your kicker, though. Your kicker is my favorite kicker in the Michael league. Michael Badgley? Yeah, the Badger. Sexiest kicker in the league, no doubt. <laughs> the real honey badger. Love that motherfucker. <laughs> Gary, Gary V client. Kid's a beast. He's probably like the only bright spot of your team's future. It, yeah. Right. <laughs> Derwin James, done. You don't have a quarterback. Like, Jesus Christ. You guys are in shambles Dude, is, over there. I was, like, looking forward to watching this team's defense, and then Derwin James is hurt. Melvin Ingram's, like, holding out but not holding out. Joey Bosa's, like, whatever. Like, who's, the, who's the cornerback that you guys had that was, like, Jason Verrett? He didn't get hurt yet? I mean, I he's been they on would, the team in, like, three I, years. but I know, but I figured they would just report, like, Chargers <laughs> cornerback Jason Verrett. Towards nah, he, he left here. his injury woes, like, back with the team. I can't wait for like Casey Hayward <laughs> or Desmond King. He's a real one. He wouldn't leave his boys behind. <laughs> yeah, them jacked boys are going to have fucking jacked up ACLs. Yeah. All right, all right. That's all we got for this episode. Shut your mouth, Mike. For this episode of Punk Fed Breakdowns, <laughs> make sure you're subscribed to their channel. Make sure you go shave your fucking nuts because I know how nasty a bunch of you guys are. <laughs> Manscaped.com. <laughs> promo code right BDGE. Up 20%. I'm looking at both of you and the audience. And fucking, I'm coming for everybody's head right now and for the season. BDGE, 20% off, free shipping. Like this shit. Subscribe to this shit. Fucking talk shit about us in the comment section. I'm out. We're out. We talked about nothing and we talked about so much at the same time. <laughs> I think we talked about a lot, not anything productive.